So we're back for episode two of Gamify 24-7. And uh, we're, the excitement, you can you can tell that there's excitement in the studio. We've already had some reviews in. We've already been looking at the artwork and updating that. And it's been pretty exciting, actually, guys, since the first episode came out just, just under a week ago. Yeah, it's definitely been awesome. Been some cool reviews, I think, that up in iTunes now and stuff like that, and Anton's been working away on graphics and stuff, so yes, everything's go, gun ho go. Mm-hmm. Right, let me just give you a couple of the wee reviews that we've had on the iTunes feed, so cool. people can now get onto iTunes and subscribe, and they can f- uh, follow what we're doing and get the episodes as they come out, which is really cool. We're also on SoundCloud as well, which is equally awesome so from scottboy15 he says awesome show considering how new the podcast is everyone comes across as natural knowledgeable gamers and I look forward to all future episodes hey there's still time for me to show how unknowledgeable I was going to say this is our podcast they're talking about yeah (laughs) Yeah, this is us yeah I know amazing Uh, also thank you to ral82 who says great podcast from four gamers from Scotland a mix of experience and interests makes this podcast a great listen Uh, the podcast host Mike that's me apparently holds it all together and keeps it all keeps them all mostly on topic hey again plenty of time for that to change uh, subscribed and we'll listen each week so that was really nice as well I even so got thanks. a comment recently about the, cha- the podcast it was go kill yourself oh wait that was my channel oh, so, oh. but anyway thank you very much for all the nice comments guys I appreciate yeah. it. We all do. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you, people. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, thanks, Mum and Dad. Right, let's move <laughs> on then. Episode two, and this week, very exciting news. If you're a PlayStation fan or if you're someone who just likes to upgrade stuff for the sake of it. Uh, sorry, I'm not, that's not a dig. I'm just, you know, I know a lot of people <laughs> like to up, upgrade things. Uh, the PS4 Pro is out this week. Hands up. Who's getting a PS4 Pro? Me, 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 me. I'm a kind of halfway up in the air. Right, Sean, <laughs> take it away then. Is, kind of like is that because you're getting the PlayStation 4 slim and it's not quite the same height? So you're getting a half of it. It's, yeah, uh, I mean, you would think that, no. But uh, you know what? I'm, I'm interested to hear your reasons why you on uh, launch week are getting one. So take it well, away, Sean. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I've, I've held back from the, play, uh, the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One for the last couple of years. I was reluctant to buy either because I felt they weren't really quite the step up from what I was hoping they were. I think now they've got a library that's decent enough and you know it's kind of worthwhile with the price that they're charging. I think the Xbox One S and the PlayStation 4 Pro, I think if you're going in there from scratch, you've not got the previous versions of them, I think they're decent buys now. PlayStation 4 Pro obviously you're paying a little bit more £100 premium, but at the same time it is 4K HDR capable and it's got the extra processing power. so. It's going to improve on some of the games that are already out. So for us, now we've got the PlayStation VR here, it makes sense now that I'm getting it to get the PlayStation 4 Pro and making sure I'm kind of future-proofing myself a little bit. So that's why I'm kind of excited about it. There's some niggles there that I wish they had resolved, but all in all, I'm pretty hyped about it. I'll tell you the reason why I'm not going all out on launch day, and it's simply because I've got a PlayStation 4 already and yeah. I'm using it and it's it's working fine and um, the games that you're getting to play with the PS4 Pro are all games at the moment that you can play with the standard PlayStation 4. Now, that's not to take away from the extra capabilities, but I, I understand where you're coming from as someone who's gone back to getting a PlayStation 4. Going for this now makes complete sense. And the, the price tag launch of three four nine ninety nine, Kat, I think that's not actually that bad for what you're getting. Mm, yeah, like it's not too bad, but again, I'm like you, I've got a PS4 and it's like, I've, I just don't see the point for me because I've got a really small TV, A, and B, just it's nowhere near capable of looking that good. It's got a big scratch on it also. So <laughs> for me right now, it's not really top of my priorities list. I also don't like have the VR or anything like that. I'm quite happy with mine as it is, which sounds really, really boring, but like I would rather, if I was going to spend some money, get probably the Xbox One S mm-hmm. 
just to keep expanding my yeah. library, uh, mainly for Gears of War. I, I think. think the only thing you would actually be gaining by getting a PlayStation Pro, if you don't have a 4K mm -hmm. TV, is greater, better textures. Yeah. And that's about it. And also, though, the, is there not going to be, or has already happened, the software update for PS4 anyway? that improves everything. There was, there was one about three weeks ago or something, and I don't know if that was the one that then... I think I updated mine maybe last week. I think I got a software update. I'm not sure. I think I definitely yeah, did it, have one recently. It was recently, and, and I would I would assume that that was the one that would then uh, bring everything up to the standard needed for any new releases that are going to be yeah, incorporating more of the 4K. Yeah, I think they decided that yeah. at the... When they announced the, the Pro and everything, they said that all PS4s are going to get an update. To yeah, there was some updates, yeah. yeah. So, they were adding um, HDR to make all yeah, the colours yeah, yeah. all vibrant yeah. and so all I that stuff. So I think we've all got that anyway, so I'm kind of like, well, I'm, yeah. I'm happy, I'm happy enough right now, anyway. I've, I've said before, and anyone who's checked uh, like stuff on Games Lounge or whatever, I've said for ages now that if you're a current PlayStation 4 owner, and I've said it about the Xbox One as well, if you've got the original console, I'd be pretty peed off right now because I've always imagined consoles, the, the difference between consoles and PCs was mm -hmm. you bought a console, it lasted for five or six years, and that was it. You were you were sound in the knowledge that you'd bought the latest console and that was you good for that time. Now they're bringing out these iterative consoles and, you know, I think if you bought one from initial launch day, I'd be sitting there peed off that I'm not getting the best quality. Mm. But I, at least I'm glad that there are so far anyway, saying that all the games are going to still be coming out on the original versions. Yeah. But yeah, I think if you've got them, it's a complete waste of time. Well, you're getting some of the benefits like HDR anyway. If you've not got one, you as well buy an Xbox One S or the PlayStation 4 Pro. Interesting that I guess they've always kind of done the redesign thing. I mean, if you think back to the Sega Mega Drive, they brought out the Mega Drive 2, which at the time was a completely different design, a lot more sl mm -hmm. slim looking and cooler looking. They even upgraded the Mega CD and it was only out for about two weeks or something. So, uh, so you know, that's the, I, I guess the redesign thing has always happened. Interesting, though, what the, with this particular change with the Pro from a normal PlayStation 4 is that they are actually changing the, the specs. And I think that's where... As you say, there is a slight issue with some people as to, hang on a second, this is not a new console. Why am I spending, like Kat mm -hmm. says, a whole heap of new money for something that is just really a, an improvement graphically? Now, I'm colorblind. Would I even see the difference in the, in the quality of, of, uh, of, the, of a PlayStation 4 Pro? Having said all that, I have a 4K TV, and I am slightly jealous of Sean <laughs> because I don't have the console to play the, the 4K games on. So <laughs> maybe we can do some you know, wireless like bands together. together. Yeah, yeah. Yes, <laughs> we can just come together and then yeah, that'd be, be great. Nice. As long as you bring your uh, your VR, that I'll be happy enough with that. <laughs> uh, so Anton, what's what's your thoughts on on this versus say um, sticking with the PlayStation 4 or the other option, of course, which is we haven't really touched on, but the PS4 Slim. Oh, um, well, to be honest, I think it's quite interesting how Sony's came out of the gate and then established a new range of consoles, unlike Microsoft who came out and they're like, here's an S and down the line we'll have an S. Um, although I personally feel right now they're kind of almost shooting themselves in the foot with a Slim. It's so, what, £100 more, you get an Please, extra... Please. Hmm? Less, the Slim's less, or? Yeah, yeah, the Slim's 100 pounds less than a Pro. Ah, and it comes with a 500 extra gigabytes and obviously more power. Mm -hmm. So I feel like they've kind of, the Slim's almost like a devalued one. But as for kind of this new strategy they're going for, I find it very interesting. I'm kind of theorizing that they're going to go after an iPhone S upgrade cycle. It's like, yeah, your apps are fully backwards compatible and your old machine still gets apps, mm. but eventually they'll kill it off and mm. like every couple of years we'll get a new one, a new one, a new one, and it isn't going to be like this generational like upgrade. What personally myself, I'm not a fan of because I completely agree with yourself, Sean, mm -hmm. where it's like, oh, my console doesn't last five years now and it's defunct. Mm. Isn't that a PC? Hmm. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, like that's another thing. Like I, The PC, when you think about it, is really good value money-wise. I know it's all really expensive if you mm -hmm. want to get a gaming PC or gaming laptop or anything and you'll always have to like, upgrade graphics card and everything like that as you go on. But if the consoles do turn out like that, that's what, like 300 quid every time you've got mm -hmm. to get a new <laughs> console and there's so many consoles if you want to get every exclusive. A grand at a time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and games cost so much more on console than on PC and there's a lot less games yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. I, I, like, I think 
if obviously like you and myself Michael we're, we're a bit older as well and we're used to like the older consoles the retro ones where we've been used to probably a few generations of uh, consoles lasting for five or six years so I think for me it's like there's a mindset there where that's what I've always been used to and now it's changing I think if you're a younger gamer I'm not like getting on the younger gamers here I think if you're a younger gamer and you're used to the iPhone or Android sort of kind of ecosystem where you buy a phone that upgrades each year maybe you're a bit more open mm. to that sort of kind of change you know and you're like well £300 pound every year or two I'm not that bored about it however I think like when you've got games that you know take two or three years to develop if companies are making games these you want a library on that system and as long as it is backwards compatible maybe it's not too bad it's still it's still a hard pill to swallow for me as an older gamer i just want a console it's sorted for five years and i'm good to go and that's it well think about you it know, 360 how long that mm -hmm. lasted it was yeah. so good but i get what you're saying like if they came out with this thing like a phone contract like two years, mm. I pay so much every month for this yeah. to get this console right there, mm. and I can upgrade it in two years' time. I would probably, if it was guaranteed, there's going to keep being new and better yeah. ones and stuff. If the games still kind of were backwards compatible as well, totally. Yeah. Like you know, like mm. apps. If you bought an app, you've got it. I like for however, like on the Android store or whatever. I think a thing I'm scared of with this upgrade cycle is losing a lot of the core things that make a console a console. Mm. So for instance, optimization. If we've got like a game and it's having to get developed for like 50 different systems, we're going to lose the optimization mm. and we're not going to get stuff like where Grand Theft Auto 5 could run on an Xbox 360. Mm. Well, the Xbox 360 being an underpowered console compared to the PCs that were required to run Grand Theft Auto. Um, that's something I'm scared of in losing the power of the console. Yeah, mm. uh, like I think I just think, like, for, like again, I, I can understand why they're doing it and why they're thinking like it. I just think it was money. unnecessary. Yeah, it's just a money <laughs> grab thing. And it's like, I can get on board with it if it's done right, like you're saying, my phone co uh, contract type of thing, yeah. and you can upgrade and you're not losing £300 every two years or whatever. That's fine, but it's still, it's like, I think it was completely unnecessary. We have got PCs and we've had consoles and handhelds and they could stay separate, they were totally fine. You could optimise for a specific mm. console. Now you're starting to go the PC route, it's upgrading every year or two and you're having to like tailor it for several different machines. So we're losing a bit of that, what made consoles so magical. But again, coming from an older geezer, you know, maybe like a younger person would be like, who cares? Mm. <laughs> I don't know. Well... I guess you're going to be the future-proof one out of the lot of us when it comes to the PlayStation 4 because you're going to have the PS4 Pro very soon and uh, <laughs> you can give us all your feedback and tell us exactly whether all the money that you spent on it has been worth it, Sean. But, so we'll but you're saying that, that. But, who, but who knows, maybe next year we'll see we've got another one coming. I'll be like, oh, for God's sake! Well, <laughs> isn't there the talk of Project Scorpio, which we don't know very mm, much about next terrible. year? I mean, that's, that's one of the... The, the several possibilities as, as to what's going to happen. As, as you say, things do seem to happen a lot more quickly. Although, Sean, there is also the other possibility that it's just because we're old and when you get old, everything goes by quicker. So maybe yeah. the cycle's exactly the same. Listen, when I was a kid, you used to be able to buy a chip <laughs> roll for 30 pence. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone goes to Freddo's. Freddo's oh, are how you tell about inflation. Mm -hmm. like. <laughs> Yeah. Right, before you depress me anymore, let's move on to uh, the Switch. And we talked last week about the Switch in, in great detail. I think pretty much we came to the conclusion that Cat was pretty much not Im that impressed by the idea that we'd seen so far. We had some feedback from uh, one of our listeners who messaged to say, totally agree with Cat. I think it was Rally 82 said, yeah. totally agree with Cat and uh, not that keen. We will see what happens. Anton, what's the latest with the Switch? Have we had any development? since last week? Um, pretty much no. But <laughs> <laughs> the question I was interested in posing, what games would you just all, what games would they put on the Switch and you would just be like, fine, I'll buy it instantly? I can tell you. Well, <laughs> sorry, go on, Michael. Uh, it's easy for me. It's got to be Mario Kart. It's got to be Zelda, which is happening. It's got to be any Super Mario related game that is an exclusive. Anything that is Nintendo for me is fine. I'm so not that interested in ported games. At all, <laughs> yeah. You'll buy it. Games. No, no, but like I'm not. I'm not in. <laughs> sorry, I didn't word that very well. I'm not interested particularly in the Switch version of Mass Effect, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, for me, it has to be a Nintendo exclusive game that would make me go. Actually, this is really cool. Something that's that's. 
something that's uh, historically Nintendo and something that is exclusive? Well, there's like, I know Anthony's saying there's not much happened, but there has been a couple of things. If you check, it's Laura Kate Dale, I think it is. She runs a, a, like a website called Let's Play Video Games. Just chuck that in there. And she's been reporting, she was one of the ones that came up with a lot of the rumours for the Switch before the announcement. Her and Emily Rogers, I think she goes under in Nintendo 64 Girl or something anyway. Uh, both of them came up with lots of rumours and stuff. And she recently, I think Emily Rogers, just recently dropped something saying that apparently the new Mario game, the next Mario game, which is, looks like it's going to be a cross between Mario 64 and Mario Sunshine, is much further along in development than people know. It's like apparently literally finished. So, like I said before last mm. week, I'm pretty sure that's going to be a launch game. I'm almost convinced mm. that mm. Mario's going to be a launch game. I think Nintendo's going to go back to what was like with the NES, or SNES, sorry, and they're going to have Mario as a launch game, and that's going to sell bucket loads. And then a couple of weeks after that, they'll have Zelda, and it's just going to keep mm. the momentum going. Now, if they can launch with a Mario, a brand new Mario, like, um, like Mario Sunshine or something, and then Zelda straight after it, Wow, that's yeah. like that's going to blow people away, yeah. you know. That well, that for me is the key. That is the key to the success of the Switch. It's getting the stuff out on launch day, which was a mistake they've made in the past, not getting the stuff out quickly enough, yeah. and having the right titles. And for me, as I said, um, and Anton, you can tell me whether you agree with this, but I I think for me it's got to be the. The, the historically Nintendo titles, the ones that people associate with Nintendo. And it, it almost feels like a backwards step, but I almost feel that like they have to go backwards to yeah. go forwards and to make people um, fall in love again with Nintendo. Nintendo staples. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, well, there are, there's a lot of evidence kind of proving, um, suggesting, like, remember there was a big leap from GameStop talking about all the details, like the packaging, the storage yeah. capacities and all that. And a few other articles have suggested that they're going to do a lot of cross-promotion with a new Mario title. Yeah, yeah. So I think now they're really just going to try and hit hard mm -hmm. Mario title. The Pokemon companies announced they've got a game coming up in the yeah. first six yeah. months. Yeah. They've shown off Mario Kart, they've shown off Splatoon, mm -hmm. they've shown off Skyrim, and we've got Zelda. Yeah. So it just looks like they're just going to be like just hitting it full on with all these like Nintendo staples. Mm -hmm. And as well as that, if they promise and keep to their promise, third party. But they say that with the mm. Wii U, so who knows? <laughs> yeah, so like I think that's like part of the key for a lot of people is in the third party support. But I think unlike the the Wii U launch, which was a bit of a disaster, I wasn't even bothered about it. But I can understand where people came from. You know, you had New Super Mario's Wii U, which was kind of another New Super mm. Mario game, and then you had things like zombie you a brand new franchise which actually went on to sell not too bad for a new franchise mm. but it wasn't what ubisoft wanted sales wise which is a weird one and then we got delays with rayman legends that went to the other consoles so i think if they can come out with these games the big ones a couple of big games right at launch get everyone that's into nintendo stuff buying that get the sales right up hit their two million target or even mm. more and then they start hitting on the third party games, maybe a Ubisoft title at launch or something, or maybe get Skyrim mm -hmm. HD or remastered or whatever it is. Yeah, I think it could do pretty well. I think obviously in January, we're gonna get much more info on what's gonna be coming out of launch, what the system actual fuel features are. You know, there's like rumors again where they've got on, on the right hand side Joy-Con, it's got an infrared port that can be doing touchscreen masks that's plugged in. We've got rumors of replaceable controllers now at either side, so you can have different types of controls. There's the rumors that it is a touchscreen, multi-touchscreen like an iPhone. So instead of having just a single touch like we had on the Wii U, you can now multi-touch, which opens up the possibility of mobile type games, Pokemon Go, that kind mm -hmm. of things. It wouldn't surprise me if Nintendo's got all this kind of stuff in their like augmented reality, like a 3DS, augmented reality, uh, reality, Wi-Fi, you know, that kind of stuff and everything. And I said before, like about hooking up with your mobile phone, there was rumors about you could get your phone stuff coming through in your screen. I'm I, like, I'm hyped about it. It's like, I know it's dying down now, but I'm hyped because there's wee leaks coming out from all over the place and Mario and launch, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like, I, I'm, I'm feeling quite buzzed about it, you know? It's like- Kat, are you any know. more buzzed this week? Uh, you excited? No, no, oh. not at all, oh. no. And this conversation's nice, though. I like how passionate everybody else is about <laughs> it. It's refreshing. <laughs> but I like, like, for me, to even consider it, like, I, again, it would, it would probably be till if they knocked the price down a bit, even though it's not, What's, they're not usually that expensive. What, what would be a sort of sellable price for you? Mm. Or convincing price for you? Like, under 300 quid, definitely. Can't so, be dealing with. so if they said a Wii U, 
comes with the, the Pro Controller, Super Mario, or, well, not Super Mario, but whatever Mario is at launch time, and you've got the dock and everything. What, the Switch and all that, yeah. yeah. Um, but, like, two, 250 quid, would, would you be happy with that? That sounds decent. It does sound decent for a new console. Well, we'll, we'll have to wait and see, though. I, it depends. Get a job like, as a salesman, Sean. Mm-hmm. Get a job as a salesman, Sean. I know. Oh, yeah. exactly. How much? How much can I give you this for? Nintendo Paul? really well. <laughs> give me your um, best price. Give me your best price. <laughs> I am rubbish at Mario games. There you go, everyone. Platformers in general, <gasps> terrible. Super Mario, I'm awful. My little sisters, who are great, will confirm this. I'm terrible. They always made me be told, and I would just be going <laughs> on a little bubble at the end. Just rubbish. Um, Animal Crossing, though, yeah. I'm a big fan. Yeah. So, and I can see it being good yeah. on that screen because I like it more as a as a portable kind of thing. I prefer it like on the DS and 3DS yeah. than on like the Wii and stuff. Talking about Animal Crossing, there was the update you just came in for the 3DS, the free update where you get the new little trailer park thing, the campsite. But I know that DNA was making, <laughs> they're going to be making the Animal Crossing mobile version. Hmm. Don't know what's happening because we'll have more info on it. It really surprised me if that's going to be part of the switch, like some sort of, mm-hmm. kind of strategy in there where you can link it up and yeah, have a full I can see game. that. The thing that kind of adds weight to that on the list when they announced the Nintendo Switch and they showed off, oh, here's all the third party yeah, take two. Dina was on there, so who knows? It would make a lot of sense because yeah. I know we kids that have it. actually like their parents have been like, okay, you can finally have a phone because yeah. Pokemon Go. So I think this idea is giving people an entry level into some of these mobile games mm. might be a smart move for Nintendo and kind of bridging the gap. So having this convergence of the home console, the handheld and the mobile phone and trying to make it yeah. the best of. Mm-hmm. I think as well, like there was a thing with the Wii U quite early in its <coughs> kind of life cycle where they did the uh, Miiverse Plaza for Animal Crossing and they've done all the characters for it it looked amazing and they've got everyone hyped up because they were thinking oh my god Animal Crossing on the Wii U with mm-hmm. a touch screen and that'd be mm-hmm. awesome and then they brought out Festival Amiibo Part or whatever, whatever the hell it was and it just <laughs> everyone was like what the hell is this and I think Nintendo kind of got the message that everyone was mm. really peed off about that because it sold crap uh, I think the 3DS version sold quite well and stuff mm. like that, the, the home... Happy Home designer, yeah, that's the one. it's yeah. so cute. Yeah, and I think they've got that now in the 3DS version, they've brought that over now with this new update. So, you know, there's nothing really been happening on this uh, main console version of Animal Crossing for, mm-hmm. since the Wii now, the Wii. really. And yeah. that wasn't that, I didn't it really care. Yeah, I didn't City really Life. Care. City Life, it was terrible, the city yeah. was just like, two buildings or something. Like, <laughs> I didn't mind going to the city at first, I was like, ah! It was really <laughs> underwhelming. So, you know, if Nintendo can, has been working away in that and they come out with a Switch version that's portable, and it's got stuff where you, you can hook up to your mobile version of it, mm. and you can do it all with a touch screen, multi touch, and that, man, I'll be blown away. If they've got mm. that, like those graphics and everything that were in that Mi Plaza. Oh yeah, I'll be buzzing with that one as well. That'll, that's instant buy, instant buy. <laughs> we will see. Oh, we'll see we will see what happens. <laughs> Right, let's move on then. And uh, one of the the big releases of 2017 is likely to be the new Mass Effect Andromeda. Who's still reeling from the end of Mass Effect 3? Reeling in a bad way, as in the ending was freaking <laughs> terrible. Is that what you mean? Yes, that's exactly what Me. I mean. Yeah, I, unfortunately, Me. there's there's a lot of people who are were so put off by the 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 way that Mass Effect Three, the trilogy, finished that they are just because of the pure protest nature of it are not even looking at anything to the do with it, Andromeda, <laughs> but. Having said all that, there are some new, uh, there is some new information just out just today, in fact, about the new Mass Effect, and there's a new cinematic reveal trailer that you can see online. So, uh, let me just give you a few of the facts. So, this is the kind of the the the, the points that they're making. So, the the trip to Andromeda goes rather horribly awry. We could have probably guessed that without the, them telling us. <laughs> um, so. Um, you are the Pathfinder. We assumed that you're tasked with finding a new world for humanity, and you've been asleep for 600 years. And there's somebody that wants to kind of do nasty things and be the bad guy. We haven't been given much information about that. And we don't have an exact release date. We know it's going to be next year. We know it's going to be at the 
RRP is going to be £56. There's a multiplayer mode featuring up to four players. Apparently, it's going to be more flexible for skill and weapon progression. And there are new things like boosted jumps and new uh, destructible environments too. The case looks pretty good. I must admit, I'm quite excited because it's an adventure in space and anything in space has my vote. <laughs> but mm -hmm. there is the slight hangover from the Mass Effect trilogy and the third one in particular which really didn't do a good job of keeping people on site thoughts uh, i i was a big mass effect fan like that's the reason that i wanted a 360 mm. rather than a ps3 because i i'm a total bioware fan for life or was anyway mm. for life like Baldur's gate back when i was teeny that's where it started for me and Jade Empire, Knights of the Republic, everything. So, space as well, love mm. space. So, yeah, Bioware, RPG, space, great. First one, amazing. Still one of my favourite mm. games ever. I loved it. Then the second one came out and mm. I, didn't, I didn't like it. I didn't like this whole, like, it forced you to be friends with everybody. For you mm. had to to do the game right. You <laughs> had to be people. friends. That's the worst. I know. It's... I like no. I'm real life. I'm a very friendly person. But it's quite funny. It's... It's funny that you say that. I really enjoyed the first Mass Effect, flaws and all. All the oh, problems so that it good. did have, the big delays that, that you know take forever just to get through anything because of the loading screens. But but I, I have to admit that as a story and as a an idea, I felt that Mass Effect 2, whilst I still really enjoyed it, it did, it kind of overcomplicated what was already a really good concept. Mm -hmm. And then with three, I gave three a go um, and I never got to the end because my um, my brother and a couple of friends of mine had completed it and I'd heard all the stories and I thought, you know what, I just can't bring myself Spare to get through this. the sorrow, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, but this new one, I must admit, I mean, the fact that it is, it is a new world, there's new characters, um, I, I kind of feel that they've got an opportunity now to make us all love it again. Uh, Anton, what you, what's your thoughts? Um, yeah, I think they've definitely got an opportunity right now to kind of regrow some of their fan base, especially since, compared to the whole franchise, this game has been in developing, development for what seems like forever. Mm. Um, personally, there's not much I can add because I am in the stage where I've kind of like stood away from the Mass Effect franchise. I ended up buying Mass Effect 3 Special Edition on Wii U and then I heard, I was like, oh yeah, people hate this and then I never played it and it's literally <laughs> sat on the shelf, never even See, went near the Wii See, word of mouth goes a long way, doesn't yes, it? Yes, definitely. Yeah, I've never played the game myself. Uh, again, uh, like I was close to buying it on the Wii U and then they had all that fiasco where mm. they brought out like the much cheaper version on other consoles and you were getting kind of screwed over as a Wii U owner. So I kind of boycotted it myself <laughs> and I wasn't really that bored about it. So I've never played Mass Effect, but I've heard good stories about it. I've heard bad stories about the ending of the last one. Mm. So I can, can go into this in a fresh in mind and maybe I'll really enjoy it, I don't know. Yeah, because I obviously don't have an Xbox One again. <laughs> uh, so what, th that could sway it for me again, though, if the Xbox One, if the reviews were good, if it kind of went back to what it was like at the start, like a really refreshing story, good characters, it's not forcing me mm -hmm. to do things. That's the whole point of an RPG. Don't try and make things simple. I hate yeah. when they give you like the option to just do like the easy, oh, do you just want to hear for the story? Mm. Shut <laughs> up, no! It's like, yeah. I think I'm with you on this one, Kat. If they, if they can do something interesting with it, then I'm definitely there. I'm excited about the fact that you we could be having a whole new space adventure. That really appeals to me. I hope it's as good as the first one and parts of the second one. I'm not going to mm. say the second one wasn't a great game. It was. It was just, it, I just felt it was a bit overcomplicated from the first one. Uh, interestingly, they haven't revealed a release date yet, but there's a, there's a book that Bioware have put out called The Art of Mass Effect Andromeda that says that it's going to be released on March the 21st. So we can pretty much assume that they're aiming for March the 21st, although they're not officially <laughs> yeah, saying that. I so. going for March 22nd. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe. Hey, but we all know that March the 21st means September the 5th or something, really, yeah. don't we? We know that yeah. that's going to happen. <laughs> Time for the Retro Corner, and this week we are going to get Anton's Retro Tip. Anton, what have you got for us? Hello, dudes and the dads of internetness. Um, have any of you guys ever heard of a console called the Bandai Wonderswan? Yes, yes, yes. I'm going to say no, sorry. A fantastic little wee handheld. It was essentially in the 80s, 
This man, Gunpei Hakoi, made a console and it was known as the Game Boy and then he got a great reputation. And then Nintendo was like, oh, we need to delay the Nintendo 64. Um, can you get this console that you're gonna bring out in a couple years and make it come out now and rush the development by double? And then the Virtual Boy became a thing. And obviously he lost his job because the Virtual Boy was the Virtual Boy. Um, later on, um, so after that, beyond getting fired, Bandai, <laughs> a little wee company who had tried multiple times to make a console with the Palladia, a crappy Japanese console, what was kind of sexist in its attempt to get a female gaming audience, and the Apple Pippin. Yes, Apple made a console. It went as well as you could imagine. <laughs> Your eyebrow just twitched when you said that. Like, it sounds like some sort of kind of hobbit or something, the Pippin. <laughs> yes. Oh, so yes, the Pippin failed, the band, the... Um, the Playdia failed, so then Bandai was like, oh, this uh, Gunpai guy, he, he knows handhelds, he's done the Game Boy, he knows his stuff, let's hire him. And gave him full creative control, unlike he had at Nintendo, where they're like, yeah, you're making a Virtual Boy, either if you want to or not, and then it's like, oh no, screwed <laughs> up the gaming industry. Um, so there we go, we got a console called the uh, Bandai no, Wonderswan. No, 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 no. And it was a very interesting console as it took the same Game Boy philosophy but took it to the extremes, aka making a cheap console that had very simple but well refined games. So it was a cheap console, it came out the same time as the Game Boy Advance. It was, um, well, just before the Game Boy Advance, one year before, it came out in 1999. It was a black and white console and it had 16 bit processing, so equivalent to about the Mega Drive in game quality. Mm -hmm. um, and it was actually a very surprising console as it did incredibly well selling, outpacing consoles like the Wii U and that. Mm. And it's crazy how it's been forgotten and left. And um, the main reason why it was kind of left, even though outselling consoles like the Wii U and GameCube was mainly because it kind of failed. It never got over to the UK. Yeah. Uh, well, not the UK, the Western side. It just stayed exclusively in Japan, making it more impressive how it's managed to outpace consoles like GameCube in sales. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, uh, Gunpoi Koi passed away and the com company lost its direction in terms of software. But the games he did manage to get out in those first couple years with the Bandai Wonderspawn in 1999 and the Bandai Wonderspawn Color later on in 2000 were absolutely fantastic. And now these days you can pick up Bandai Wonderspawn imported from Japan for like as little as 15 pounds. And it's a really interesting Not console expensive it's designed. Then. <laughs> you could have it sideways like a regular Game Boy or you could turn it upside down and you had two D-pads so you could play it both vertically in a vertical orientation with a screen or sideways and do widescreen. Cool. Didn't, didn't it come with a, an e-reader or something? Um, or a QR code reader or something? I believe they did do accessories for it because mm, I remember there was a train game. I can't remember what the train <laughs> game is about but there was a train <laughs> game that used a Den, peripheral like Den, that. Then shoot a go, go or something probably like that. Mm, probably. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Great, I, so the... Like a vehicle would call the, that old console, yeah. The Bandai Wonderswan, and can you pick one up on eBay reasonably uh, easily, or do you have to go to a specific uh, site to get an import? No, um, they're quite easy to find. You've got the Bandai Wonderswan, the basic one, the 1999 one, very cheap. You can get them for about £15, mint condition. I've managed to get one myself. Um, you can get the colours about maybe £20, and then you've got the Bandai Wonderswan Crystal. It's a definitive one. It comes with a backlit screen. It came out in 2002. And it's kind of very premium. It's a little bit more expensive. You're talking maybe 40 to 60 pounds. Mm -hmm. But if you're really invested in it, that's a great one. And the games are dirt cheap if you're interested in it. And if you're into Final Fantasy, definitive ports for those games. I now officially hate you because I'm a sucker for collecting stuff and <laughs> I am now going to be spending the rest of my evening googling the Bandai Wonders one so thank you very much Anton for that no problem yeah. on, on a really sad note about that like Anton mentioned uh, Gumpy that was like his last console he made before mm. he died and I think he went from the failure of the the Virtual Boy to that and then he died and it was like this guy who was an absolute genius that saved Nintendo, and that's what he was kind of remembered for, those two failures and sort of commercial success. It's like, what a shame, man, because the guy was a genius, but... Two, two consoles, though, that were quite possibly ahead of their time. I mean, the Virtual Boy, had he had the technology 10 years down the road, it would have been a different thing altogether. Yeah. And I guess a similar story with, with the Bandai Wonders one. I mean, it sounds like getting the six, getting a 16-bit console into that size and, and price and at that time was uh, was no mean feat. So, um, so yeah, so interesting. So I'm going to be checking that out tonight. That's my evening sorted. Yes. Thanks for that. Hope you guys enjoy it. It's a great little wee system. Yes.
Well, that's pretty much it for episode two. Um, if you want to get in touch with us, you can actually email us at gamify247 at gmail.com. And uh, Anton's been working on some brilliant artwork along with, uh, with you guys. Uh, okay. Next week, we're actually going to reveal how this is recorded as well because it's a little secret that we haven't revealed as to the way we record the, the podcast so we'll, we'll talk about that in episode 3 but um, I think that's it was there anything else that you guys wanted to add before we, we finish up this week or are we good? No, just remember and send in your comments feedback jump on iTunes and remember and give us a review on there share subscribe, it subscribe yeah. make sure you subscribe whatever you do uh, thank you very much guys and uh, we'll be back for episode 3 next week cool. au revoir bye